his conclusion stems from the fact that the absolute alone is true, or the truth alone is absolute. One may set this aside on the grounds that there is a type of cognition which, although it does not cognize the absolute as science aims to, is still true, and that cognition in general, though it be incapable of grasping the absolute, is still capable of grasping other kinds of truth. But we gradually come to see that this kind of talk which goes back and forth only leads to a hazy distinction between an absolute truth and some other kind of truth. And that words like absolute, cognition, and so forth presuppose a meaning which has yet to be ascertained. Section 74 left off by suggesting to us that if we look at the assumptions that underlie skepticism about our ability to get to know the absolute through cognition, by, by actually working, through actively doing science, and not just science in the narrow sense of the term that we use it today, but in Hegel's broader sense of Wissenschaft, science as uh, essentially philosophy, carrying out a systematic uh, exposition that takes into account the human being, their own location in history, all the development of consciousness, uh, we've talked about a lot of this in the preface. So um, there's a skepticism about that that says, well, we probably shouldn't even try to do that sort of thing. And, and you can still see that around today. Um, that skepticism is going to recur in philosophy and in, in politics and culture in all sorts of forms uh, throughout all of human history, um, most likely. So this fear of error reveals itself as a fear of the truth. And here in this section um, 75, he's going to talk a lot about truth. So we want to get into that. It says, the con this conclusion about fear of truth stems from the fact that the absolute alone is true. Or that truth alone is absolute. And now what does he mean by that? That's a great Hegel slogan, and when you whip that sort of thing out, that's exactly the sort of thing that will get people criticizing Hegel and saying, yeah, I mean, look at this. He thinks that the fact that my shoes are actually on, somehow that's the absolute. That's not what Hegel's saying. We have to, we have to exercise a bit of charity, a little bit of, you know, thinking things through here, uh, and, and not just uh, taking easy pot shots. He did set himself up for something by saying that, didn't he? Um, what does he actually mean? The truest form of truth, where truth is something that's not just, you know, say a proposition and its connection with something, but a deeper form of truth, a more systematic, integrated form of truth, is only really available to us through what he's calling the absolute. So what, what that means is the totality. And this is somewhere where Hegel is definitely committing himself to something that goes against many other uh, modes of philosophy. So the, the absolute is truth. One way you can think of it is the, the system itself as a totality is what is most true. But truth also, if we follow it, leads us there. That's what the second part of that formulation is. The truth alone is absolute. So when we grasp something as true, we can also grasp a kind of falsity within it. And insofar as there's still falsity in this play between truth and falsity within it that we can grasp as conscious beings, something that, that you know, Plato already noted, Aristotle already noted, um, you know, the great scholastic philosophers noted, insofar as we can grasp that, we're not yet at truth with a capital T. We're not yet at the absolute. So um, he says, one may set this aside on the grounds that there's a type of cognition some other kind of cognition, that uh, although it does not cognize the absolute as science aims to, see, science, Wissenschaft, tries to grasp the absolute, tries to grasp truth with a capital T by understanding everything as best as we possibly can at this point in history, from the vantage point that we've allowed ourselves to get to, engaging in all that we can give all these sort of provisos, right? Science tries to grasp that. Science is the kind of cognition that is, in fact, tailored to being able to do that, in part because it's part of the absolute. But there's all sorts of other modes of cognition that we engage in, and don't those also engage with things that are true? That, that's what Hegel is having his interlocutor say to him. Don't those also deal with truths, with, you know, a small t? So 
he says um, that kind of cognition is still true, right? Meaning that it actually does meet its object. If I say to you, there is a book here, and that book has um, 500 and something pages. I don't know, because these aren't numbered here. Let's say it's got 600 pages. If it actually does have 600 pages, we say that's a true statement. It does describe that, that object. But then you can say, well, who, who cares? What's the meaning of that? And then we can say, well, you know, it matters because, you know, books over 700 pages cost a lot more money to print. So if we know that, and I'm just making that up right now, actually. Um, but if we know that about this book, that it's got only 600 pages, we know that it's within this, this margin that we want. So you see, truths lead to other truths. And we can sort of widen out the network of truths and eventually get to something that we consider to be absolute, something that we consider to have meaning in and of itself, something where we don't have to say, well, who, gives, who cares about that? Why does that matter? So that's true, that's neat, but why do you care? Um, the absolute is sort of the answer to that. But we have all sorts of other types of cognition, all sorts of other getting to know things, all sorts of active you know, disciplines, which do cognize other kinds, or let's even call them uh, domains of, of truth. So, want to know about the human body? Maybe get yourself an anatomy textbook, or take an anatomy class. Go to an anatomist who actually doesn't just have that cognition in a textbook, but, but has you know, managed to make that part of his or her mental makeup. Then they can look at the muscles and skeleton and nerves and tell you something about the human body, right? They are engaged with truth, but it's not truth with a capital T. I've got a few examples here that I thought, you know, i just play around with. Think about mathematics. Um, true, mathematics is this beautiful discipline, which is very attractive, um, because through it we get to know all sorts of true things. We call those theorems. We can prove them within the system. We can even prove a theorem about the fact that we can't prove all possible theorems within the system. Gödel's incompleteness theorem, right? But that's modeled math mathematically, modeled mathematically. Um, and it's, it's got a kind of beauty to it. Um, so there is, some, there is truth there. We can grasp that other kind of truth. Um, cooking. You may say, now we're like going low scale. Well, you know, um, if you actually think about cooking, it's more than just, you know, a teaspoon of this and turn the heat up to this level and a cup of that. Um, if you really understand cooking, you understand an awful lot of stuff. You understand how favorite <laughs> flavor profiles work together. You understand something about the history of the spices that you're working with or the providence of the food or how the uh, you know, environment that the wine came from affects the way that the wine tastes. You understand something about human physiology, about how we perceive things. Um, you know, to be a chef is actually to master quite a body of, of knowledge, whether explicitly or implicitly. Neuroscience, another great example. Everybody's wild about neuroscience these days. Um, I'm always a little skeptical of the claims that get made. But um, I don't want to worry about, about that. What I want to say is neuroscience cannot tell you why we do neuroscience. And that ought to concern you. Neuroscience, you know, I don't think can tell us a lot of the things that it claims to tell us. Um, but that's sort of a quibble about, you know, how much truth is actually there and how much of it is, is puffery or reading too much into things. But it, it can't actually address the sort of dilemma that would be put to it by, by Socrates in, in the Phaedo, saying, um, you know, if I thought everything could be reduced to materialism, and he's not saying it exactly like this, but if I thought everything could be reduced to materialism and just the makeup of, of you know, configurations of things, then these bones would have gotten themselves the hell out of here a long time ago, and I wouldn't be waiting around to be executed. Um, it just pushes problems further back. And, you know, these are our truths. I don't want to say that they're not. Hegel's not saying that they're not either. But if we want to see them for what they really are, then they need to be encompassed within absolute truth. And these other disciplines need to be in some way, not, you know, that the, the, the Hegelian philosopher needs to be a chef, 
and a neuroscientist and a mathematician. But he needs to know enough about these things, enough about the available bodies of knowledge at the time, to be able to incorporate them within the, the framework that, that he or she is working in. Otherwise, what happens? Here's where it gets really interesting. He says, we gradually come to see that this kind of talk which goes back and forth only leads to a hazy distinction between an absolute truth and some other kind of truth. And words like absolute and cognition presuppose a meaning which is yet to be ascertained. This is an issue. Those who are only focused on these, these other kinds of truth, let's call them truth, you know, small t, and say, well, yeah, I understand that that's not the absolute truth, but I'll, I'll let that worry about itself. I don't need to be concerned with that. I'm just going to focus here on my discipline. They don't realize that what they do is thereby elevate that discipline to the capital T, and then they end up introducing all sorts of falsities into it by not um, actually thinking through what absolute truth or what genuine science would entail, um, they're just sort of playing around with words is what Hegel's saying. Instead of troubling ourselves with such useless ideas and locutions about cognition as an instrument for getting hold of the absolute or as a medium through which we view the truth, Relationships which surely in the end are what all these ideas of a cognition cut off from the absolute and an absolute separated from a cognition amount to. Instead of putting up with excuses which create the incapacity of science by assuming relationships of this kind in order to be exempt from the hard work of science, while at the same time giving the impression of working seriously and zealously, Instead of bothering to refute all these ideas, we could reject them out of hand as adventitious and arbitrary, and the words associated with them, like absolute, cognition, objective, and subjective, and countless others, whose meaning is assumed to be generally familiar, could even be regarded as so much deception. For to give the impression that their meaning is generally well known, or that their notion is comprehended, looks more like an attempt to avoid the main problem, which is precisely to provide this notion. We could, with better justification, simply spare ourselves the trouble of paying any attention whatever to such ideas and locutions, for they are intended to ward off science itself and constitute merely an empty appearance of knowing, which vanishes immediately as soon as science comes on the scene. But science, just because it comes on the scene, is itself an appearance. In coming on the scene, it is not yet science in its developed and unfolded truth. In this connection, it makes no difference whether we think of science as the appearance because it comes on the scene alongside another mode of knowledge, or whether we call that other untrue knowledge its manifestation. In any case, science must liberate itself from this semblance, and it can do so only by turning against it. For when confronted with a knowledge that is without truth, science can neither merely reject it as an ordinary way of looking at things, while assuring us that its science is a quite different sort of cognition that for, for which that ordinary knowledge is of no account whatever, nor can it appeal to the vulgar view for the intimations it gives us of something better to come. By the former assurance, science would be declaring its power to lie simply in its being. But the untrue knowledge, likewise, appeals to the fact that it is, and assures us that for it, science is of no account. One bare assurance is worth just as much as another. Still less can science appeal to whatever intimations of something better it may detect in the cognition that is without truth to the signs which point in the direction of science. For one thing, it would only be appealing again to what merely is, and for another, it would only be appealing to itself, and to itself in the mode in which it exists in the cognition that is without truth. In other words, it would be appealing to an inferior form of its being, to the way it appears, rather than to what it is in and for itself. It is for this reason that an exposition of how knowledge makes its appearance will here be undertaken. Section 76 ends with a very important turning point that I want to call your attention to right away. It's a very long section and there's quite a bit going on, and I'm probably going to have to erase the board 
uh, about halfway through this. But I want to stress where he's um, ending up. He says, for this reason, an exposition of how knowledge makes its appearance is going to be undertaken here. So what does that mean? He's going to look at, in this introduction, and then really through the rest of the phenomenology, how does knowledge, how does science make its appearance, not just how does it show up, how does it you know, emerge at one point or another in history, but how does that appearance actually develop over time and become something more than just appearance, become essence. This is uh, something that is really central to the entire Hegelian dialectic. So he's, he's peeling back the, uh, the veil at this point. But first, before we get there, let's talk about all these things that Hegel wants us to consider rejecting in this very long uh, and rather long-winded paragraph where he says, instead of troubling, instead of, instead of, instead of, let's do this. So, what we should reject, he thinks, are these worries, these skeptical worries about cognition as an instrument or a medium. Why? Because they make this assumption that cognition is something that's cut off from the absolute, and that doesn't turn out to actually be the case. It's not as if the absolute exists over there in its purity all by itself, and then we have our cognition, which we could do epistemology and scrutinize in, in, in all of its respects before it actually engages with the absolute over there. Um, we're, already tonight, we're already connected together. We're already involved in the process. As a matter of fact, the process has been going on for a long time before it because we call that process history. And epistemology, really, for Hegel, has to be situated within history of ideas or history of consciousness, not the other way around. Not first we do our epistemology and then decide whether any of this history stuff means anything. Because if you do that, you're actually probably going to decide that history doesn't mean anything. But you won't do anything beyond epistemology at that point, uh, which is rather boring. So that's one thing that we want to reject. Another thing we want to reject is assuming that science can't get to the truth, um, that's done basically so that we don't have to do the work of science. Again, I, I mentioned a sort of pragmatic uh, feature to this. If you don't actually put yourself into the mix and try things out, even though you're not 100% certain, even though things are being developed, you know, as they're, they're going through, even though they're never completely finished, at least in our experience or our lifetimes, if you don't put yourself in there and start doing something, start cognizing something, instead of just worrying about whether you can cognize something, you never will do it. You never will, in fact, get to know anything. Hegel even rejects refuting these ideas and, and, and approaches. Now that's kind of an interesting thing. Why doesn't he do a critique of them? and say, you know, we weigh the pros and cons and decide, nah, we shouldn't look at things this way. Um, or, I've got an argument against them. He, he's, he's actually saying something more like, look, some people want to be in those positions. I'm not going to bother refuting them, because I'm actually going to get on with the work of science. And the refutation will be in showing them that you can actually know something, you can actually do something, that human beings can actually develop to, to get to know the absolute, or become part of the absolute, or realize that they are the absolute. So these are things he's rejecting. And then he has this interesting passage where he say, he's not saying we're going to reject these terms like absolute or cognition or objective or subjective, and we can think of a lot of other terms in our own time that people like to use. Um, he says... Um, the words associated with these, these adventitious and arbitrary ideas, the things we're rejecting, uh, and countless others, their meaning is assumed to be generally familiar. So, take objective and subjective. And ask yourself, if you have to explain those to somebody else, what the hell do they actually mean? Can you on the spot give a satisfactory definition of those terms? I'm willing to bet that you can give a definition, but probably if you start thinking about it very much, you'll see that perhaps these are not as, as uh, cut and dried as you think. They're not as counterposed, or they're a bit messier. Um, is, is subjective always bad? You know, Paul Ricoeur says there's good subjectivity and bad subjectivity. What could that possibly mean? And we can say the same thing about absolute. 
What's the absolute? Do you know? Do I know? Does Hegel know? Is it just a word that we kind of throw around there? It's, it's that thing over there. Well, let's not call it the absolute then. Let's just call it the thing over there. You remember back in the preface when Hegel said, you know, I'm not going to use the word God for a while because that word's kind of, you know, vacated its meaning. I'm going to use words instead like, you know, the absolute or being or, you know, uh, perfection or the eternal. I'm going to use words that, where we can grip something in there. And the absolute, boy, that's one that you can easily turn into, you know, anybody's uh, shibboleth. It can mean whatever you like it to mean. <clears throat> Cognition, knowledge, something the modern philosophers were obsessed with. What is it? Now, Hegel's not saying that you have to be able to give a perfect understanding of that. That would be actually to be at the end of the system, at, you know, be part of the absolute. But um, you do have to have something better than just knowing how to spell these words or throw them around in, in conversation you know, to pepper your, your discourse with. So he says, um, a lot of people assume that these words, the meaning is, is generally familiar. But that's kind of a deception. To give the impression that their meaning is generally well known or that their notion is comprehended, their concept is, is understood, that would be a deception. Remember, what is a notion for Hegel? What is a the griff. It's this thing that's essentially a self-moving entity where it becomes its own other. So, you know, objective, if we really grasp the, the notion or the concept of objectivity, objectivity also involves its opposite and its reincorporation of that opposite back into itself and it develops in history. So, you know, if you, you can't just have a dictionary definition or, you know, a textbook definition that you're going to use. You need to actually, you know, think through. That's what the notion means. You need to think through what these things actually would mean. So he says, um, thinking that this notion is comprehended, that it's clear as a day, as, as a bell, clear as day, uh, is actually a way to try to avoid understanding the notion. It's a way to try to avoid doing work. and sort of skipping steps, you might say, if we want to think about mathematics. Um, or using cliff notes. So he says, um, they're intended to ward off science itself. And here we're getting to, to another term. They're intended to ward off this systematic Wissenschaftliche way of slowly coming to understand uh, what's actually going on. And now I have to do a little bit of erasure. So while I'm doing that, let me once again remind us that when we're using this term science here, um, that's translating Hegel's German Wissenschaft. And Wissenschaft doesn't just mean uh, the natural sciences as we tend to talk about them, or even just the social sciences. Um, doesn't just mean scientific method or something like that. It extends to include the history of consciousness. It, it, it involves the knower as much as the known as part of what is being known. So it's a little bit more involved than that. So Hegel is talking about science. And science. And here he's talking about science. And um, using this word. Appearance. Now, we often contrast appearance to reality. This is only apparent. It's not real. Um, but appearance is itself a, a certain kind of reality. We also can talk about appearance as, like, you know, this person has just appeared. The, the night sky, is, the moon has just appeared, right? That means that it's just come on the scene, and now we're perceiving one aspect of it, uh, the moon is over there right now, it's going to be over there later, perhaps it's low to the horizon so it's big and blue, and by the time it gets over there it's going to be smaller and yellow, you know. There's all sorts of things that are going to change over time. Science, when it's first coming on the scene, is an appearance. It's not uh, fully 
developed as science. That is, it's not completely systematic. It's not completely worked out. Uh, it's not completely reflexive. You know, when a science is in the process of being worked out, there will be things that we know, but we're not quite sure why we know them. Or we have certain results, and we're, you know, we're confronted with those results, and we're like, how the hell did that happen that way? Um, what does this actually mean? That reflexivity is that process of reincorporation. Hegel talks about this as you know, self-othering and reincorporation of the other. He talks about this in terms of Aufhebung, or transcendence, or, or overcoming, or sublation is how it's usually translated. But we could think of the, this in terms of uh, reflexivity. So he says, science, when it comes on the scene, is an appearance. In coming on the scene, it's not yet science in a developed and unfolded truth. It hasn't fully become what it's supposed to be. In this connection, it makes no difference whether we think of science as the appearance because it comes on the scene, uh, alongside another mode of knowledge, so this is another important thing. Uh, we have science, and then we have other mode, and I'm going to put the you know possible plural here, of um, knowledge. And the connection that we're going to want to know is what is the relationship between this and this, these other modes of knowledge. Is science counterposed against them, like the true to the false? But these are other modes of knowledge, so they can't just be false then. One, this is important. One of the things that makes science what it is, is that it relates itself to other modes of knowledge and doesn't just you know, banish them and say, get out of here, You're, there's, there's nothing to you. <clears throat> but it takes them in and shows to, uh, shows to us the truth that these other modes of knowledge are not yet aware of themselves containing. Or at least that's Hegel's view on it. So he says, um, it makes no difference whether we think of science as appearance because it comes on the scene along another mode of knowledge that's perhaps better established already, or whether we call that other untrue knowledge its manifestation, saying, well, you know, think about alchemy and chemistry, right? So chemistry is developing through chemistry we're getting to know the world. Not everything, you know, not everything that's science for Hegel is chemistry, right? But chemistry would be a, a part of it. And alchemy was a discipline. They weren't just puttering around doing, you know, totally random stuff. They, they had a body of knowledge. Turned out that some of it was bunk. Some of it was based on, you know, kind of crazy assumptions. Some of it was things that might have actually worked in another field, but didn't work in terms of, of chemical reactions and, and compounds and things like that. Um, you know, because they, like, they were interested in psychology, for example. Is the science coming on the scene and just sort of counterposing itself and saying, I'm the truth, you're false? Or is it coming on the scene and saying, um, we're going we're gonna to pull the dross out of you and leave behind the husk, the empty shell, and we're going to take what's good? Um, Hegel says, in any case, science has to liberate itself from just being appearance. How does it do that? Well, that's that unfolding, that developing, that dialectical process, right? Uh, it does that by turning against that. For when confronted with a knowledge that is without truth, science can, near, can, can neither merely reject it as an ordinary way of looking at things. Why can't it reject it? I'm going to pause on this for a minute. Why can't science just reject it as an ordinary way of looking at things? Because it is a discipline. If you want to be an astronomer and say that astrology is actually false, even though a lot of people seem to get something out of it, it's not enough just to point out you know, uh, the fact that astrologers aren't really able to make uh, good predictions about human behavior. You have to do more than that in order to, to banish it. You can't just treat it as, well, that's what the dummies or the ordinary people do. He says, um, science cannot merely reject it as an ordinary way of looking at things while assuring us that its science is a quite different kind of cognition for which that ordinary knowledge is of no account whatsoever. 
nor can it appeal to the vulgar view for the, intimidate, the intimations it gives us of something better to come. Science actually has to deliver. It can't just say, well, you know, in the future, it's going to be revealed that I'm right and you're wrong, because we're actually here in the present. So, you know, this is something, this is a point where we ought to actually think about some of the claims that get made by scientists today about, um, you know, metaphysical topics like free will or uh, what addiction is or, um, you know, whether we can come up with a science of morality. Um, those are pretty big claims, and you don't get to make those claims by saying, well, you know, in the future we'll prove that X, Y, Z. <clears throat> if it's real science, you got to demonstrate that in the, in the present. So... Hegel says, by the former assurance, by saying, look, this is just garbage, and we're the ones who have the truth, science would be declaring its power to simply lie in its being. But the untrue knowledge likewise appeals to the fact that it is, and assures us that for, for it, science is of no account. So here we just have a, a struggle between two things that are and merely appealing to that's the way things are, these are two different viewpoints on what is. They're both grasping different uh, parts of what is. Um, so that's, that's not a successful way to, to fight the battle, you could say. So he says, um, the uh, one bare assurance is worth just as much as another. Still less can science appeal to whatever intimations of something better it may detect in the cognition that is without truth to the signs which point in the direction of science. For one thing, it would only be appealing again to what merely is. It would just be like pointing out, you know, this is, this is the way things are. This is the way things are in that discipline. Um, for another, it would only be appealing to itself and to itself in, in the mode in which it exists in the cognition that is without truth. So, if chemistry is going to say, you know, that alchemy stuff, mostly garbage, but parts of it not bad. How do you know it's not bad? Because uh, the parts of it that aren't bad are what we do. Again, um, not all that helpful to do that. You know, the parts of it that aren't bad are going to allow us to, like, transform the whole, <clears throat> the whole um, economy, the culture that you live in. I mean, think about the, the sort of things that chemistry has made possible. Just think about plastic, for example, and what that's, that's done to our, our entire life world, right? But that was something that was, uh, you know, a far-off idea at one time. It's not something you can appeal to and say, um, here's my evidence. It's way over there. So he says... Um, for one thing, it would only be appealing again to what merely is, and for another, it would only be appealing to itself and in the mode in which it exists in the cognition that's without truth. In other words, it would be appealing to an inferior form of its being, to the way mm -hmm. it appears, to the way it is at that time, rather than what it is, and here Hegel's going to use an important term, what science is in and for itself. This is a key phrase for Hegel. Um, I'm going to give you sort of a clue right here. When you see that, you can tell you need to underline that part and say, ah, what's been happening right here is a major part of the dialectical advance that we've made up to this point. Because uh, it's usually some sort of consolidation that's going on. So he says, that's why we need an exposition of how knowledge makes its appearance. We need to think about how science goes from being appearance to being something that is fully worked out, that is fully developed, that is fully unfolded, that deals with the, the absolute as such. 